Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name is Fong, and with me are Bob and Lily. Greetings. Hello. Hey, guys. Hello, hello. So, um, today, uh, what we do here, by the way, at uh, Watching Silent Films, we pick up a movie or shorts and a series of shorts and watch it and talk about it. That's the long and short of it, as it were. Um, this week, we're going to talk about Within Our Gates, a uh, 1920 Oscar show uh, film. Uh, Within Our Gates premiered about a year after the Chicago riots. So mm. if you guys are aware of history, um, uh, I'll, we'll put this in the show notes as well. But it's a list of mass racial violence in the United States. And just looking at historically, this started um, pre, you know, 1860s, you know, all the way back in, in the in the you know 1800s and before even just in the initial colonial days <laughs> when we were uh when uh, america was trying to sort of develop the western states like in california there was a genocide there of californian indians you know mm-hmm. i mean what was the number here it says the u.s army killed almost you know 1600 to 3000 to 4000 indians just genocide like, right uh... i mean that's like from the you know, almost the early stages of who who knows what happened before that. This is stuff we have records of. Yeah. But think about like when you know when we were you know expanding here, right? When when uh, you know the founding of America and you know what happened afterwards, right? Who, right. Who yeah, knows? But... Untold numbers, right? But mm-hmm. even after that, as far as we have records of, it's that. And then there's a bunch of other racial violence from here after that. There's the Reconstruction era violence. There's the lynching era, you know, all the way mm-hmm. from late 1878 to 1939. Um, there's a, more civil rights stuff, uh, and certainly the Chicago one is the big one, where in um, it's called the Red Summer. And in 1919, it was huge. You know, that's the 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 race riots of 1919. It was just as big as now um, here. Essentially, what happened? This was that. Um, in the South Side of Chicago, uh, this is during sort of the early days of like immigration flooding in, right? And so there's a lot of Irish immigrants now in Chicago, and they sort of have some neighborhoods part of Chicago, and they kind of you know own that quote unquote territory. Uh, but this is post like you know sort of the era of like Emancipation Proclamation and the sort of you know african americans are migrating more to the north so that they can have a more less discriminated at least in mind uh, place to just survive in you know Mm -hmm. so a lot of them moved um to the south side of chicago and then you have this tension right between Mm -hmm. the irish uh neighborhoods and the predominantly african-american uh communities and it just blew over into a huge thing um you know because the irish viewed sort of the blacks was like, well, they're stealing our jobs and our economy and they're kind of encroaching on something we were established here. It's the whole, like, we were here first mentality. And during um, the summer, um, there was uh, Eugene Williams. uh, He he was an African-American youth who was swimming in a uh, uh, pool and pools were informally segregated. Like, some places say it's like whites only some of those colors as mm-hmm. he inadvertently uh went into one and you know he got killed of, over that and the tension just blew up after that and so you got this huge amount of uh rioting happen and while that was rioting um and sort of sort of uh, a lot of people got killed the uh, something like what was the number i, I don't know the exact that was something like 30 something people were killed half of which two thirds of was white or two, th- two, two, two thirds is black and one third is the, the Irish. And it's like a war. Right. And meanwhile, the people in power, right. This is the uh, Chicago police department. It turned a blind eye. They were just like, yeah, let them, let them deal it out. We'll clean mm-hmm. up afterwards. So between the mayor of Chicago, which is uh, William Thompson and also uh, Frank Lawton, which is the Illinois governor, they're just like, you know, they delayed in sending the National Guard in for four days. 
there's just like so many different things as if this stuff doesn't matter right Mm -hmm. right and it was such a degree where ultimately even the president at that point uh woodrow wilson had to you know pass legislation to decrease the racial tension and discord just across because of this you know so that was the huge thing that was happening um, right before this film was was released. So that's that's a big context. Mm-hmm. And I also bring all of this up to just say that, you know, like these riots have, have been happening, you know, and, and, and had been happening. So what we're seeing now, even though we're getting more social media coverage, is not new. You know, it goes back to the founding of our country, whether you like it or not. <laughs> it's part of the fabric of the United States. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 You know, they say the country was born on that sin of the the, the nation's original sin was slavery. So Yep. It's very much the reason why they, they say that. Let's so. let's tie that into within our within our gates. Oh yeah, let's because I think that's exactly what we're that's what I was trying to go for is that a big portion of this film was talking about that particular lifestyle that's so because you know it stars that that plot was the 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 main character sylvia landry the character is from the south you know yeah. that's a big part of her story and that's why i want to tie that into let me just read the plot because it's kind of convoluted not convoluted it's kind of complicated how about that so let me just read it because it makes more sense if the the, the uh, audience understands. So the film starts with uh, Sylvia Landry, which is a young African-American woman visiting her cousin Alma in the north. Now Landry is waiting for the return of Conrad as they plan to marry. Alma also loves Conrad, uh, the cousin. So um, Larry, Alma's stepbrother, attempts to woo Sylvia but is rebuffed. Um, now Larry kills a professional gambler in a game of poker. Alma arranges for Sylvia to be caught in a compromising situation by Conrad when he returns. Conrad begins to strangle Sylvia, but is stopped by Alma. Conrad leaves for Brazil. Sylvia returns to the South. (laughs) Sylvia meets uh, Reverend Jacobs, a minister who runs a rural school for black children called Piney Woods School. The school is overcrowded, and Reverend Jacob cannot continue on the small amount offered to blacks education by the state. With the school facility uh, facing closing, rather, closure, uh, Sylvia volunteers to return to the North to raise $5,000. Sylvia's purse is stolen in Boston. Dr. Vivian chases after the thief and recovers the purse. After being hit by a car that stemmed from saving a young child playing in the street, Sylvia meets the owner of the car as she recovers in the hospital. The owner is Elena Warwick, a wealthy philanthropist. Learning of Sylvia's mission, she decides to give her the needed money. When her southern friend, uh, Mrs. Stratton, tries to discourage her, Warburg increases her donations to $50,000. This amount will save the school and Sylvia returns to the South. Reverend Jacobs asks for Sylvia's hand in marriage, but Sylvia, now in love with Dr. Vivian, refuses. Larry, in the run from police, runs into Sylvia and attempts blackmail with the secrets of Sylvia's past. Instead of stealing from the school on Larry's behalf, uh, Sylvia steals away in the night and heads north. Later, Dr. Vivian searches for Sylvia. Larry, who has run out of money, returned to Alma, is fatally shot during an attempted bank robbery. Dr. Vivian, by chance, ends up treating Larry and meets Alma. Alma tells Dr. Vivian about Sylvia's past. These flashback scenes are portrayed in the film. Sylvia was adopted and raised by a poor black family, the Landrys, who managed to provide her with an education. During her youth, the senior Landry was wrongfully accused of murder of an unpopular but wealthy white landlord, uh, Griddlestone. A white mob attacked the Landry family, lynching the parents and hunting down their son who escaped after nearly being shot. The mob also lynched Ephraim, a servant of Griddlestone. Sylvia escaped after being chased by Griddlestone's brother, who was close to raping her. Noticing a scar on her breast, Griddlestone's brother realized that Sylvia was his mixed-race daughter, born of his marriage to a local black woman. He had paid for her education. After he brought her life, Dr. Vivian meets with Sylvia, he encourages her to love her country and take pride in contributions of African Americans. He professes his love for her, and the film ends with their marriage. I just want to Mm-hmm. run through the plot because it's really complicated <laughs> it was it was a complex plot mm-hmm. it was it, it 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 is one of the earliest if not the earliest um 
uh, filmed by an African American director that is surviving that we know of. Mm-hmm. Maybe others, but this particular one is is uh, was discovered. It was thought to be lost. Just yeah, later. I found um, a VHS on sale on either eBay or Amazon, so I saved the a picture of what it you know claimed on the back. And uh, of course, as we mentioned, this film was created as a response to the birth of a nation, which you know depicted Southern whites in need of the KKK to protect them from the quote unquote bloodthirsty blacks. Mm. And then Misho shows the reality of Dixie racism in 1920. Just uh, and it, it it continues on from there, but it was I I was happy to find you know this VHS just to see what it looked like because I think they this is from 2012 that this particular covers from, but so what are your first impressions with this film? Um, well, definitely when it mentioned the restoration that it had been found in Spain, retitled as. Am I, am I allowed to say this? La Negra, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Um, and then it says, you know, this nitrate print was copied to safety by the Filmoteca Española in Madrid. And then, you know, eventually transferred to the Library of Congress. But uh, I was when I was doing some research on this film, a lot of black silent film makers were found in Europe. It's, we were kind of you guys were talking about it earlier in the podcast as well where sorry i'm blanking um <laughs> you it, i don't know in a sense it just not that america's embarrassed to have these but they're being rediscovered in you know kind in like spain or obscure countries where people who had a love of film wanted to collect them and that just seems to be where a lot of these are popping up mm-hmm. That's well, pretty. certainly that, but also is uh, it's kind of the uh, kind of availability of the film itself. Mm-hmm. So a little bit of history. We we went over his history very briefly uh, in his pre- his other film, which is later after this one called uh, Body and Soul. So Lily and I reviewed that in the first five or six podcasts. Um, you can go back and kind of listen to that one, but. Uh, one of the things we talked about was his background, and he himself had an interesting life. Um, when he was born, he basically kind of hitchhiked across the country on trains, and he kind of saw America um, just from from you know from place to place. So he had an interesting life, just himself. And um, his father was a slave in Kentucky, born a slave, mm-hmm. and just he's got this interesting story so he it turned out that he actually wrote uh an autobiography called the homesteader or something like that I think mm-hmm. that's the name yeah and then he um actually adapted that autobiography into a film that's his first film uh, in 1990 called the homesteader and then he would go on to do within our gates this is this is this was only his second movie which i'm shocked by i'm like a guy who out of nowhere, it seems, you know, didn't have any film experience. He probably watched movies, I want to guess. But, you know, he would make one movie. Uh, he only, And it was uh, it had to be independent. These are kind of what's called a race films in the sense that these are kind of mm-hmm. films made only to the, the target audience is African-Americans because they had a tough time distributing this, right? I mean, mm-hmm. at that point, um, so many people just... It was just wasn't on the radar of um, if you were a if you were a cinema, you know, in a predominantly white town, you might not like, you know, why are you showing this? You know what I mean? So, I mean, the people there, the cinema there, as well as the audiences, you're you're showing movies for the paying audience. Right. And so, yeah. Anyways, long story short is that he couldn't get investors into his movies. So he actually has to find self uh, finances. He was kind of entrepreneur. Right. So at that point, he already had a big career as an entrepreneur doing a lot of different things, which you can kind of research and do about. But the, but at this point, um, he wanted to focus on this particular media because of um, the messages he wants to communicate. And so he had an autobiography, Homesteader, and he adapted that into his first film. Mm-hmm. But he only had four prints to show, just four. Because, <laughs> you know, film prints back then cost money. 
And that's mm-hmm. why you can see that's why they don't have surviving prints. Because think about like, I don't know, the birth of the nation, thousands of prints, you know, thousands. And so hundreds, if not thousands. And so obviously it survives, right? Because a lot of people wanted it. They got it. They, they, they showed it. And so, but with this one, with just these four, like, what, how's he, what's he going to do? Like, he has to go around and he uses skills as a businessman and salesman and just, you know, went around everywhere to show these movies himself, you know? And so it's not surprising that a lot of these film prints aren't discovered here, you know? And that's why rare, rare prints are found in Europe and other places. Just want to explain some of the yeah. reason why the film prints aren't even available. So cool. Now talking about the film itself, um, I actually liked the film quite a bit. I thought it was an amazingly serious um, storyline. And I love that it was an all black cast, which, you know, uh, and I love that. You know, the, the the characterizations were really cool. I mean, uh, La- Larry the the Leech, <laughs> as he was called. Um, That's right. It's like the Chicago gangsta. <laughs> yeah, Larry the Leech, the underworld character. Yeah. That's right. He was he was notorious. The first time I saw him, I said, "Ooh, this guy is this guy looks sinister." And that was before I even heard his reputation. I said, "Oh, he looks sinister." And he was, you know, and I thought that um, the the main act, the main character, um, Sylvia, I thought mm-hmm. she was done so nice, so sweetly, you know. I mean, I I really liked her quite a bit, yeah. and uh, I felt so bad that she was involved with all these terrible characters, <laughs> um, especially Larry. But her friend, what was her friend's name? Irma? Alma. Alma. But that's her cousin, I think. Her cousin. I I didn't understand why she seemed to be um, undermining her. Was she jealous of her because of... She wanted Conrad. Oh, she wanted Conrad, yeah. So she wanted wanted to put a rift between them. Her fiancé, and so when her fiancé wrote a letter saying, hey, I'm going to be here, so-and-so, she specifically, you know, dressed nice. To right. sort of, you know, lure him and also yep. try to put Sylvia in a comp- I don't. It seemed like the compromising position was that she was alone with a white guy in a different room. And then so when they opened the door, they were like, look, you know, she's kind of like cheating on you or something. It, at least that was the yeah. implication like that. It wasn't really written somewhere, but it was. That's yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. That was probably the one bit of context was kind of weird because once we got to the end of the film i was like is that her father i was hoping not. <laughs> yeah so that's what when i read that plot then i understood it more but i thought for some reason i thought griddlestone didn't die that he uh survived the gunshot mm. and was he arranged it to me when i first watched it i thought you it was him who was masterminding stuff mm. where he was sort of you know causing the mob to happen and to kind of get out of control but also that he was kind of going after Sylvia as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I thought it was that, but after I read the pl- it wasn't super clear. I don't think the movie made it super clear that there were two griddle stones and both are brothers. Right. And so one of them is killed and one of yeah. them is yeah. the, the one that ultimately being the dad of Sylvia's dad. Yeah. And a lech. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Who was... I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the character. Um, but he was the um, the guy at the window when when the other guy shot through the window, and he ran and told everyone about the crime. And oh, his his character's name was Ephraim. That I Ephraim, believe. yeah, well, Ephra- Ephraim. Ephraim. Ephraim was is, Ephraim is the uh, the the. The servant, right? Is, yeah. Is, is Griddlestone's mm-hmm. servant. He was another weasel, though. He was another yeah, weasel. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he... Uh... Well, he's the Uncle Tom, right? The most recent example we have is um, Tarantino's movie, uh, Django. Samuel L. Jackson's character. 
Do you remember? Yeah, yes. he, that's movie? what that reminded me of, actually. Exactly. So I, I've seen Django Unchained. And, of course, his character is based on stuff like this. This is an archetypal ca- character throughout literature. Mm-hmm. Um, so, anyway, so that's kind of the character. And that's why he was, at the end, he was like, you know, he's like, I... You know, he he was he didn't he thought he was untouchable. He was like, I'm yeah. amongst the mob, and I'm not going to be lynched because I'm friends with you guys, <laughs> right? So, right. Mm. Right. Maybe like I, I thought that was a let's just lynch that guy for no reason. <laughs> well, I thought well, that's the whole thing is that I yeah. thought that was this this movie is so complex, right? It's not literally black and white about its themes. It's not just like. You know, white people are bad, black people are good. It's not just about that. It's this multiple shades of gray about all these, the whole cast of characters of varying degrees of people that are not always good. They're right. not always bad either. And right. it's just so fascinating to see, like, you've got this gangster character who is, you know, killed somebody and he gets his come up- comeuppance, right? He, right. He's a guy mm. that you don't want to be associated with. Yes, he's black, but he's also like a gangster. And it's like, right. mm, it's is Oscar Michelle trying to perpetuate some sort of stereotype? Because you know, nope. other white directors have have done stuff like that, and it's like no, perpetuating because that. You sim- because you totally should feel for Sylvia. I mean, right? That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. But that's what I'm saying is like he's he's providing a whole cast of characters. Right, that... and then there's right there's the white lynch mob, but then there's also. The, the older white woman who's trying to help save the school. Right. He he has been criticized, Oscar Michelle, for being kind of like a a showman. Like he's sort of catering to a specific market. In a, in other words, yes, he's you know definitely stands on the side of sort of sort of ha- helping the cause for African Americans. But on the other hand, he has also been historically been criticized for including things that can potentially perpetuate the stereotype of like African Americans on screen, you know, like the uncle Tom character. Well, you know, in a lot of films, that yeah. sort of mentality can be taken where right. you try to portray a character realistically and it could be taken as what you're, what you're showing as opposed to creating a realistic character. And that's, right. that's just unfortunate to me. That's like, you know, you can't tailor all of your films and all aspects of your films to those who can't discern the difference between a character <laughs> being an element of the story and a, and a and a public statement about you know their behavior. Right. In other words, if you have a director who, in every film they make, they shows an, they show an Asian person who's the bad guy, who's corrupt. Right. Well, <laughs> you, you clearly make a statement about that, you know. Right. But if, but if you just have one film where an Asian happens to be the bad guy, he's not making a statement that Asians are bad guys. It just happens that the Asian is the bad guy. <laughs> you know. So that's co- that's the complexity, I think, of yeah. films like this and, and the way he's making this specific film is that you have these representatives of some of these issues that he's bringing up. And, uh, you know, even in his day, he was kind of at odds with the contemporary sort of African-American art- artists, even contemporaries of that. Like, just to sidetrack a little bit is that we didn't really talk about it, Lily, when we talked about Body and Soul, but... Um, it's interesting because maybe we did talk. I, I actually haven't listened to that in a while, so I don't remember. <laughs> mm. But um, Oscar Michel actually took a, a critic. He criticized um, W. E. B. Du Bois' uh, works. Right. It. It. He basically was saying that you know it wasn't sort of furthering the cause. He would criticize people he didn't agree with, including African Americans. Mm-hmm. Is, is the point. And. Um, mm-hmm. Paul Robeson, Robson, Robson. He he's the actor that starred in that movie, Body and Soul, and he's mm-hmm. he would be in plays written by white people, um, and uh, playing very various different characters on stage. Mm-hmm. And so when he ended up casting Paul Robson in his film, the Body and Soul film, he was actually 
implicitly criticizing Paul for doing that, for portraying, for being in plays written by white people <laughs> for black roles. So, like, but the the real life person Paul didn't even realize it until he was done with his movies with Oscar Michelle's movies and afterwards he was like oh that guy he really snuck it under me and then uh in you know hmm. through all his biographies he would claim that his first movie wasn't this one but a movie after this one was his first movie he would just like ignore the fact that he starred in Body and Soul <laughs> very interesting Mm. Yeah. I so, I so that the point I'm trying to make that point is that he would, in his films, criticize. Doesn't matter who. If you had a flaw, he would just like lay it out. Is I think the point of, of all these different characters of his film, this particular film that he had. Really, we only have two films: this one and Body and Soul. That's it of his, as far as I know. I, I, I haven't seen that movie, but the first question that has to come to my mind is: Is it an actual public statement? Or is it just a character? And that the, the public is, the certain people are making it out to be a public statement. Oh, no, no. He was, he was very vocal about it. He, he, so he, uh, Oscar Michaud was a uh, author as well. He was a writer for his own material. Mm. He would write books and novels and different things. And then he would also, he has a lot of stuff. He's got, so in essence, he was racist. I, I, don't, I don't know if I would say that. But I think he was very critical of a lot of people that wasn't to his degree of sort of uh, almost like his degree of thinking. I kind of I kind of yeah. know what you're saying. So I was just yeah. like, yeah, yeah, he's criticizing Paul. I don't know. He's criticizing Paul Robeson for trying to for, you know, well, for himself being an actor you know, on stage. But it's a play by white people. I like I almost feel. He wants, you know, he's kind of saying, why don't, why aren't you doing stuff by us? Right. You know, but I don't know. It's like, I I see it half and half, but yeah, he's very critical, but I don't know. He's not afraid to speak his mind, which is also fascinating. Because Part of his personality yeah. is, he's complex because like all human beings, is that he know. was such a uh, a showman and such a entrepreneur that he want he would often just um kind of actually there's a line in this movie within our gates where that preacher guy was basically saying i sold my soul after he mm. did the uncle tom thing too mm -hmm. in front of white saying like oh yeah yeah yes yes sir yes sir. like the whole act that he did in front of yep. the, how like mm -hmm. the the black people can't vote and there's two white right. characters saying what do you think reverend can or 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 whatever the preacher guy right and he mm -hmm. was like yeah yeah you're right like and then he, once you close the door he was like I sold my soul for for something for nothing yeah. or something you know and so I feel like you know I would say that he Oscar Michelle the director had not like sold his soul per se but he would do a lot, anything for like money he was such an entrepreneur that it w it wouldn't be beyond him to portray stereotypes as long as he, he got the fame and fortune and money you know um that's why he started creating all these different things he would like write a lot of books and sell them be a sh you know salesman he would make these movies and he would be a showman he would just go around and do whatever is necessary to you put know, his name out there the criticism the sounds media. to me like yeah. saying to someone why don't you stay on your side of the fence and that and that bothers me. Anyways, so that's kind of the point of this uh, the the Oscar Michelle thing is he he was very much into sort of uh, putting this out there where you know he wants everybody to like his stuff, right? <laughs> so, um, anyway, so when he was making this um, movie, uh, this is only his second feature. Uh, he was going to work with uh, another sort of African-American producer, uh, kind of, you know, Link Lincoln Films. I think it's like, I forgot the guy's name. But but he ended up just creating his own company. He just he just wanted to do his own thing, you know, is, is kind of the point. Hmm. So I can't say I uh, see anything wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he wants, he kind of wanted to trailblaze his own things. So, so that's, the, that's kind of the start of this. Um, it is often 
the uh, uh, tribute it in, I guess, analysis afterwards as a rebuttal to the birth of the nation. Um, mm-hmm. you, ha- you haven't seen that lately, right, Bob? No. But roughly you knew what it's about. Like I watched it a long, when I was like a teenager a long yeah. time ago. And uh, I think that a lot of the racist um, subject matter of it was w- way above my head. Um, so this film is, you know, a lot of people are saying that this, a lot of critics are saying this is a response to that movie by saying, you know, the it, kind of flipping on its head, you know. It's like three right? hours long though, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yep. So in that movie, there's also relationship between North and South. And this movie also had a some sort of relationship between North and the Southern. Uh, I think there are some surface level stuff like that. And... Um, I don't know. It, it was just interesting to to see that analysis happen. So I just attack on that. I mean, I, when I was uh, taking my notes for this film, you know, sometimes I like romanticizing about what the you know what the titles mean. I don't know. I'm just throwing. I just threw down like you know, within our gates invokes exactly that. You know, come see our life and find out we're not so much different from you in respect of like throwing hmm. it back. You know, throwing it back at birth of a nation because it's just like suck on this you know it's like you think you're so great because you're white no we're great too in Mm. having you know having that pride it's like (laughs) i don't know that was just that was just my two cents that's an interesting take i i I remember going about two-thirds to three-quarters through the film and saying and pondering the title and saying well what does the title mean you know within a within our gates that was a good take. I, I I actually didn't come up with a very good understanding of the title. At least that's what I that's what I got out of it. it just because I was also wondering before watching the film, like, are we going to be looking at not a gated community, but you know what maybe the gates could mean heaven's gates or blah blah blah. But that's just how that's what I felt when watching this mm. because it's in the end, it's about. Equality, and that is also mentioned in this film too. That I think it's the same thing. Father Ned, the or Pastor Ned, he also mentions that in the same line, talking about how he sold his soul yeah. for his people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He. Yeah. When he um, when he gave the sermon and got them all fired up, and then with very shifty eyes, he goes, "And now let's talk about the collection." <laughs> it was like, oh man, you know, like, <laughs> and yes, uh, he definitely he goes he, when he when he comes out the door and he closes it behind him and says and admits to himself that he's like sold his soul to the devil. It's like I thought he was gonna hand some of that offering to those people for whatever reason, but it hmm. didn't turn out that way. I don't know why he was there. Was he trying to collect something? I I didn't understand that part. Why he was with them was he trying to collect something from them some offering from them? I, I didn't understand i just read that he was visiting his white friends but he mm-hmm. i don't know it never another kind of little thing of the film where it's like you didn't really yeah. get that context properly right. i don't think i will say that um the costumes in this film were pretty spectacular oh i love the costumes i would mm-hmm. say if you zoom in on the details ev- like especially the primary african-american cast yep was just dressed up like everybody had this it looked like just premium costume i agree but he had I a limited was, budget so it was interesting that's how amazing you that off. yeah <laughs> i i felt like it was a yeah when i was in the first five minutes i felt like wow this is a really cool really good production i think that he all so one of the things i multiple things i know is one is that every main character african-american character on this regardless of what their actual turn even the 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 leech guy everybody was dressed to the t like everybody had the best dressed so no matter what kind of character you were even a, a shady one or a bad one you still got a a basic dignity and respect for every single character the way that they're portrayed and and act, acted on the screen but also yeah. like the way they dressed yep you know what i mean i agree for the most part there was one character that has really weird head head makeup 
it looked like he was wearing some prosthetic that was like falling off his forehead. And it was like, what is this about? Why did they have him done this way? Um, it was somewhere around the gambling scene. I don't remember that. Part. I know. Mm-hmm. I, t- I can't think of who it was. Was it the guy that was cheating with his cards when he was throwing them out? I don't think it was him. Uh, I'll have to I'll have to find it again. It was really bizarre. I, I said, why is this guy done this way when everyone else has done so well? Hmm. I'll I'll find it. I'll show it to you later, Yvonne. Okay. And they'll sure. both. So, so that's what I... The biggest thing I noticed was just the costume design on such a limited budget. I think he had to, like borrow it from uh, plays or something. I think that's how you got away with it. Um, yeah, it said he, has, he had about, about 15 grand Yeah, back, like now. Yeah. I don't know what that was back then. Yeah, and so it's, I mean, he's often not known for being stylish. He He's often about the message and sort of the packaging of his films. You know, a film of ideas, I think, is his major thing. So, um, there is another thing where that uh, southern character, Mrs. Stren, the one who's trying to convince the other philanthropist character to not give money. I basically, hated her. She was, uh. yeah, so she, her message was basically saying, what was she saying? They're just, they're happy being slaves or something like that. Some message like. Yeah, leave, leave them the way they are. So, yeah, they'll be frustrated with all the complications of of the knowledge they'll be given. Yeah. So she's supposed to be a lookalike to Lillian Gish, which who is the star of the the well, one of the stars of the Birth of the Nation. That's kind of the Oh, she was a counterpart in this film huh. to, to what Lillian Gish would have been. Yeah, so yeah. that's the dig. So his well, dig you know, was like this. I especially liked her one one part of her part of the movie. And that is when the lady decided she was going to promote the school and the way the expression on her face and the way she was went off in a huff like oh that's terrible you know and she yeah, she, and just she went off how <laughs> offended she was by it was like yeah. why was she so offended you know that someone was helping the black folks to have a decent school <laughs> yeah like wow that's like so extreme <laughs> It is realistic, though. Unfortunately, realistic. I, I thought that uh, it, in it, it, it just uh, there's too many, almost too many things in here. There's just so many different things. I mean, you got this whole concept of like, um, you know, there's like econ- economic classes, mm-hmm. you know, in 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 even the African American community between sort of the the schools. Uh, that are underfunded, which is still a current issue. Obviously, everything in this is a current issue. Mm. But like mm-hmm. the school, you know, doesn't have enough funding for education, and if they don't have enough like, education, they can't vertically get themselves out of their economic status. So that's yeah. like a small, minor thing that is shown, but it's it's obviously a big topic. Um, there are things like, you know, southern. Obviously, the big thing is the southern versus northern thing, where it seems to be more freedom. Uh, in the north, in general, versus sort of the south. And by the way, the um, I looked this up on Google Maps. Um, they are these are real places: um, Vicksburg, uh, Mississippi, and uh, Piney Woods uh, is about an hour and ten minutes away from one another. So these are real places in Mississippi. They're not made up. Mm-hmm. Just FYI. Mm. But um, but yeah, so. Uh, you know, there's that issue. Then, then there's like, in amongst sort of the African American community, there's this like, that that uh, Uncle Tom character with a grill stone, but uh, but also like, the preacher too, I think. Um, and then like the leech, mm-hmm. there are all these sort of shades of characters, or but also like, you know, Alma, Alma the cousin who, you know, is jealous and of you know Sylvia the main character. And so, and also, also these different um, sort of—I uh, don't know what the word is—the the, the the guys who just all of a sudden like fall in love with her instantly, mm-hmm. right? Like the the reverend who teaches mm-hmm. school wants mm-hmm. to marry her, and then the gangster guy, um, the leech, and then also like you know Doctor Vivian, just like 
Hmm. So in in some ways, it resembles a lot of the melodramas of its day, yep. silent film wise. Um, She's a magnet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I feel like there's just so many different topics within one film, you know. Mm. There are many topics in this film. There are, yeah. But I like the fact that, as you previously mentioned, I think one of the strengths of the film is that he's fair through his view of the characters, that uh, he takes a, a variety of characters and shows many different aspects, tr- realistic aspects of of who they are. Um, that you have one that's jealous, one that's greedy, a preacher who, you know, is more concerned about um, his his security, his popularity, and then you have Leech, who's bad through and through, <laughs> criminal, and then you have um, Ephraim, who is, you know, just a weasel and wants to be on the right side of the of the the safe side of the confrontation. I yeah, just I, I, I like re- I like the array of characters. Yeah, I was reading this. Uh, that's where I got it from. But it, it's a uh, he's listing all the different things, not complete, but it was like the complex plot in the here in this film is uh, love, betrayal, murder, rape. <laughs> there you go. Gambling. Uh, yeah. Incest, racial uplift, white bigotry, black migration from rural south to the urban north. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so it's clearly not trying to be one-sided and say the black man is good and the white man is bad, you know. <laughs> and this is a they call this uh I guess in retrospective called a new negro film sort of wave, I guess, where this wave, you know, like French new wave, there are these waves of films. He's one of the progenitors of this wave of uh, silent film yeah. kind, of, kind of kickstarting us. He had a long career. Some of the so these are the only two silence he has, by the way. So he, his talkies definitely uh, have been preserved. I mean, even inside of this, there's like women's rights. But above that, it's not just women's rights. It's black women's rights. Mm-hmm. It's so granular like that. It's like she opposes voting mm-hmm. not for women, but black women to vote. Right. Mm-hmm. It's very, very specific. Mm-hmm. I, to be honest with you, I didn't even realize that was a consideration in 1920. I thought that didn't even come about until, like, I didn't even think that was even considered until, like, the 50s. You're talking about voting, or are you talking about the civil rights stuff? Black citizens having the ability to vote? I didn't think that was until just not long before the civil rights movement. I think um, if they're citizens, they can vote, (laughs) regardless of color, right? (laughs) I I actually didn't think so. Yeah, I think how it was, I kind of remember this from school they would try to chase people away because i don't know like you know it's the same thing their vote wasn't worthy even though they were voting for some some white person you know still not good enough Mm, i remember that they would intimidate them to stay away from the polls yeah Uh, and that upsets me too it's a lot that upsets me (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know where it's funny that we talk about the racism in the 40s, the 50s, and then the civil rights movements in the 60s, and we say, you know, and we think, man, that's like, what, 60 years ago, and we're like, and, 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 and you know, we're, we're a generation, two generations away from that, and yet we we haven't progressed that far. I mean... Yep. <laughs> nope. We haven't progressed nearly as far as we should. <laughs> and I think that's why it's important that, like, I, I actually found this on Twitter. Someone had posted, and we'll do a link to that, too, because uh, the woman who posted the tweet about Within Our Gates, I shared with Yifong. But, you know, it's just, we need to talk about these people who have done these films, because if we don't, no one's going to. Right. And even when I did my solo podcast with the cheat, you know, we only hear about, you know, the great white American directors. Mm. I mean, you know, there's Hitchcock and then you have right. 
you know, who else? You know, uh, like in D.W. Griffith and who's he, what's it, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you never hear about Alice Gee. You never hear about Lois Weber. Not really, unless you're hardcore. Right. Because in the cheat, there was a uh, uh, Sesue Hayakawa. And, you know, he was the leading man. And he was a leading man. Hmm. It didn't matter if he was Asian or not. He He was like a sex symbol. And people loved him. Like, white women went to go see him. Asian women went to go see him. Like, he was gold. <laughs> mm. But because of racism, he had it, he kind of was chased away from the movie life. And he ended up doing more plays. And I think he ended up going to Europe and didn't really come back to doing films until he was on the in the Bridge of River Kwai, I think is the title, in mm-hmm. 57. But, you know, it's – if. We don't talk about people like Oscar Michaud. No one is going to know these people exist. Wow. Ugh. And, you know, even though he's one of the most well-known African-American directors of the silent era, um, there's still others. But unless we dig them up, no one else will know about them. Thank you. <laughs> Very good point. That's a you, – you, you turned a light bulb in, in my head on that one. Yeah, it's that was just something I realized when I was doing the podcast. It's just, you know, we only because I took a I think I took one film class in college. It was just about movies or something. And I think I still have my book. I don't remember us ever talking about anyone that would really stand out, whether that's, you know, a woman or a person of color. Definitely not Native American. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you're white and male. Good luck. Because, you know, women can't do anything. God forbid. <laughs> well, it's it's partly, it's partially because those were the individuals that were empowered. Mm-hmm. That they dominated the field. But, I mean, I, 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 I don't know this. I don't know how much the, the non-empowered individuals were repressed, suppressed from being successful intentionally suppressed is what I'm talking about I mean if you've got the white males in power empowered and that they're, they're basically controlling all the purse strings for producing films you know and they're mm-hmm. favoring each other so the question is how many of them are intentionally keeping the funds away from female directors or African-American directors, you know? Mm. And I'm sure that enough of that went on intentionally, but I just don't know how, how much of it, any ideas or I'm not far off base. I'm sure I know it happened. I know it, yeah. I know it went um... on. I just don't know how widespread it was because like you said, we don't hear about the African-American directors from the silent films through the classic, you know, 20s, 30s, mm-hmm. 40s, you know, through went talkies. Yeah. Were, were they just not there because they weren't getting funded or were they there and put on the shelf immediately? A mix of both, I would say. A bit of yeah. each? Yeah. I mean, you, you definitely have... Um, I mean, even after Oscar Michel himself started making talkies and he was one of the most successful filmmakers in terms of the race films, it, it didn't mean that, you know, he made it big, right? It didn't mean that he was as big as any of the other directors of those days, you know? And that's why, as Lily was pointing out, it's uh, it's it's just the system, right? The studio system afterwards, you know, the rise of the studio system in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, prevented uh, artists like this he was truly an independent and you had to be um for somebody who was kind of an outlier you know gotcha mm-hmm. that's too yeah. bad it's another it it's another slap in uh in the face of our culture yeah absolutely mm-hmm. i mean it wasn't really until i don't know I, I i i said this before but my knowledge film knowledge of the from uh the studio the golden age 30 40s through I want to say 80s, it's a big gap. I, I, I'm not very familiar, actually, with that history of mm. American films. So I'm not entirely sure if there are famous... i got to imagine there are. I just can't think of any uh, African-American well, directors and filmmakers of that era. 
Not until like Spike Lee. Exactly, he's exactly who I was thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, definitely he's huge now. But I before that maybe before there. That, I I no. just haven't studied, so I don't really. Yeah, know. Yeah, Spike um, Lee definitely broke ground. Yeah. And and people like him. They're they're one of many, and especially nowadays, of course. But prior to that, I I don't really know. I mean, I mean if they were so popular, maybe I should know. You know, but I just I don't mean, know. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's a baffling thing because I mean you have yeah. someone like Akira Kurosawa who's made fantastic movies. Oh, he's my yeah, one of my favorite directors. Yeah. And you know And you know about him and he's not white. So <laughs> Exactly, but he's so mom- he's monumental. I mean, yes. monumental. And yet yeah, like what happened in the 40s and 50s were the monumental black directors of the 40s and 50s and 60s. <laughs> there, there's definitely a black spo- exploitation sort of era, black exploitation uh, films. They're they're all certainly made by African Americans, um, but I don't know their names. Like Shaft, I know that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Roundtree, I think. But that's that's even later, I think, than what we're thinking of. The studio system. I'm not, I'm not sure there are any. I mean, there's got to be. I got to imagine. I just don't know who they are. Homework project. Yeah, it mm-hmm. just feels like they they may have just been making movies outside of uh, the studio system. You know, hmm. Oscar Michelle definitely is the big one. But then there's this big gap. I think. I don't know. That's interesting to know for later <laughs> all right so i think um really the only other interesting part i mean there are many interesting parts of this film but it's really the the lynching thing theme uh scenes towards the end wh- mm. when they uncovered uh sylvia's backstory what do you guys think about that lynching scene as well as just the whole attempted rape scene and i'm, bo- the I'm glad deal? the boy got away on the horse i was so relieved i was like <laughs> when they shot him i was like oh it made me he feel terrible. Yeah. yeah, I thought they killed him, and I was like, oh. I thought so, too. And, and then he got up and got on the horse, and I was like, yes, she got away. <laughs> Same. <laughs> and um, I guess I felt like, you know, I thought it was very, it's just very sad. I mean, any, any, Lynching is such a horrible thing to think about and to see on film. It's just the the mob mentality of them taking justice in their own hands and and hanging someone. Even you know, I felt even bad about it when I watched old westerns. You know, I don't care if it's you know who who it is. Like it could have been a bad guy in a western you know, white guy, and they're going to lynch him, and they're a lynch mob, right. you, know, you still feel like, this is wrong, no, they can't right. do this, you know, yeah. but uh, then when it's innocent people, it's even worse, you know, and like I say, you know, it's like, one of the, one of the things, I, I, some, I, I, you know, I, I the this topics I don't want to approach, because they're too hot, so, All right, I'll go there. Um, I get in trouble with some people because I say this, but I can't help it. You know, like, um, oh, I, I've already said it before. You know, it's like, I believe people should be colorblind. I mean, I see us as one race. I, I don't, I don't pay attention to someone's skin color when I meet them. <laughs> it's, it's such an ignorant thing that people do that, that they, you know, I literally tell people I don't see color. And, like, you know, there are friends of mine who, if someone tells me they're black, I'll be like, are they? You know, I'll have to think twice about it. You know, it's like I just, it's not worth mental time to that kind of recognition. And I think that when people do that, the more we continue to recognize it, the more we continue the racism. I don't, I don't see people characteristics of people by their skin color period and so it 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 almost becomes difficult for me sometimes to talk about it because some things i say will be offensive to 
people where racism is such a big deal it's it, it's in their eyes constantly and i can understand that because some people deal with it every day and recognize it every day fortunately with white privilege i don't have that burden and even saying that putting that into words offends people you know admitting it offends people you know and i'm sorry if anyone's offended if any listeners are offended by that you know it's like you know well, i think the i think the whole point of the the movements riots and stuff and in or sort of the discourse in the last weeks and days and weeks and so on i think is to, to kind of confront some of that is that yes you know it's the whole all lives matter and we're all run race and it's i think it's a good concept and idea but how it plays out is that it it has the potential to invalidate the the specific concerns of the specific right races right right meaning like you know there's a specific experience that black people are going through that right. if you're not black you're not really going to be able to understand that right and um, exactly the mm-hmm. further kind of this is the discourse right is that the further you bring up the all lives matter or that you you think that there you you ought to be colorblind uh you know invalidates that concern because it is so specific like mm-hmm. it you know it matters because it's the way they live their lives right and i think that's the whole notion of having an understanding like it would be good to obviously have you know the whole colorblind and everybody doesn't see color they just see people right that's that's the ideal that's the utopia right like i I think i said before but the reality is not that way right the reality is that you know myself i'm gonna have a specific you know asian american experience that's gonna be very different than your experience right yep Mm -hmm. um but it it shouldn't invalidate one another. I think the the point is I think the point is to understand one another more is the whole point, right? Yeah. Is that you, Bob, would be able to understand ideally, kind of walk a mile in their shoes and kind of have an understanding who they are in their experiences, and and vice versa. I think you know if you have this, um, uh, you know, whoever's lives matter. You know, today it's black, but maybe there are other ones out there too, right? <laughs> like, I've seen some of those uh, Asian Lives Matter and, uh, or Police Lives I don't know. There's so many different things now. Whatever X Lives Matter. I think there are a lot of discourses about what those specific terminology and, and terms mean and what they mean to kind of how you were brought up. Mm. But I think that, you know, like I was pointing to earlier that in order to really understand each other, I think you really have to be in each other's lives, you know, like mm-hmm. it's okay to have black friends, but it's a whole nother story to kind of be talking to them frequently. You know, it, it, it really depends on like what, what, what your definition of that is. There's an article recent, I read recently too, of this um, privileged black family who grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood and there are more of the upper class Mm -hmm. um, middle class they're not you know in the and so when they grew up with just all white friends he's like the only token black um, friend between this group of people he just he has a uniquely perspective unique perspective that no other people have Mm -hmm. he's wrote about this experiences and the point is i think is to be in such a way with each other's lives that you can you might not be able to walk a mile in their shoes but you'll have a, a greater understanding of their lives yeah than you don't and i think that's kind of the goal and and how you can do that is you really start sort of uh do, i think you have to kind of cross some barriers and in and kind of be a friend to somebody in a way that you might not be able to previously you know I'll give well, an example. I'm, I'm talking about something specific. So, like, I'm um, not sure. so when 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 I am, you know, I met somebody at church who was from, uh, he's Haitian American. So, mm-hmm. I I don't know anything about Haiti or Haitian history and stuff like that. And I'm like, part of my being friends with him and for me to cross the bridge 
uh, or gap of not realizing what this is, is that maybe I have some prejudices against that stuff. I have no idea. But we shared a meal together. My, Our goal was that uh, I was going to share my meals from my culture and he was going to share some meals from his culture. And that brought us together. Like ultimately he brought some, you know, Creole type meals and stuff I've never had before. I have no mm-hmm. idea. Something I asked specifically, I said, you need to give me something specific. Like only like you guys eat, not white people eat, just you guys. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I feel like something like that allows uh, an exchange of culture and allows some understanding of sort of, a little bit what people go through. I'm not saying just like eating alone will yep. cure racism. I'm just saying that when you have people are where you're in each other's lives so much mm-hmm. that you're eating and talking and you're sharing your lives exactly. to a degree where mm. it, it uh, and you do it over a long span of time, right. I think that that starts to break down some of those barriers because it's no longer fear. It's no longer an unknown. Exactly. It it's something like that's known. And, and it's like you're just friends and you don't think about skin color unless someone brings it up and puts it in your face. Because you're past that. But but it's it's not just about the the lack of skin. It's the it's the exact skin that actually makes us who we are, right? Like no. Y- y- so like okay, so like <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm from Asia and I have this, you know, heritage and and skin. I can't just say I'm white. Because I'm not. I have something specific to me that has a cultural experience that came with me, right? I can't just ignore this whole side of me, right? I'm both. I'm both cultures, right? Because no matter how I scrub, I'm, I'm still not going to be white. <laughs> let, me, let me back you up a little bit there. I think you right? can't ignore it unless it's brought up. The question is, how often is it brought up and why is it brought up? Otherwise, yes, I think you should ignore it. It's like... Why? Why is it an important topic? You know, it should only have to come up every now and then. Mm, oh, I, I think we have to get, have to agree to disagree there. So. Oh, okay. We'll we'll yeah. have further conversations on. Yeah, that. I think we'll have to have to kind of dive in more on your podcast. But, um, Lily, do you have any closing thoughts? I think uh, we can go on, but it's, it's definitely <laughs> a hot topic. I think overall, this particular um, film. Uh, well, I guess, uh, if, in case anyone wanted to know when Sylvia needed the five grand in 1920, it was <laughs> equal to $64,000 now. Wow. Well, I it's 11 it times, like, right? Yeah. It's about 11 times the, the currency. I but think, then, roughly. but then the school really got 50,000. Uh, yeah, I think the lady gave her more. I did not. Right. I actually forgot to look up how much that was. So it's just times but, yeah, 11. Just, so just if it was 60, yeah. so that's 600,000 instead, right? Woo-hoo. Something like that. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Closing thoughts on the film. I, I mean, I'm happy to have seen it because we just, we needn't hear more of these stories. Yeah. You know, despite that it's 100 years old now. Mm. You know, really, nothing has changed, unfortunately. Not really. There's been little increments, but a lot of the stuff that was happening back then is still happening now. And yeah. unfortunately, some of the same thoughts are being still being thought from then to now as well. Yep. And if we didn't have, you know, critical filmmakers like Oscar Michaud, nothing would come of it and then we wouldn't really be open to these thoughts happening back then which unfortunately once again are happening now so mm. i think he's an important dir- filmmaker to watch and understand his th- not his theories but his ideas because you know if he doesn't say him, no one's going to. So someone's got to listen. And that's kind of just my thoughts on the film. Besides, I also enjoyed it. I really like Sylvia's character. I was, uh, I don't know. <laughs> that's kind of it. Yeah. I love the costumes. I love the characters in their own right. And under, you know, just understanding more of what he was trying to do. And learning more from our conversation, talking about it as well. 
Yeah, I actually uh, wrote down some things too uh, that we didn't get to, but these are real quick. So, remember in um, when Sylvia, one of the plot points is Sylvia was rescuing a child from being run over by a car, was driven by a philanthropist woman there. But Mm -hmm. when she did that, they moved her into the car. So, you know, she's now on the ground. She's injured, right? Sylvia, the main character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when a bunch of people came along, they moved her into the car. Right. Well, then she got up and sat in the car by herself. <laughs> Once mm. they moved in through the door, you could see in the window, she's like, oh, I'm okay now. I'm going to sit. <laughs> remarkable into a healing. Seat, slide into a seat by myself. I thought it's that was a miracle. So she's not that, she wasn't that injured to be carried if she can sit up and move. But anyway, this is like a movie making thing. Don't they have a name for <laughs> yeah. those people that run up in front of cars to get hit? <laughs> oh yeah, I, uh, I don't remember what the term is, but they, I'm, o- uh, I'm only kidding. But <laughs> well, they 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 it does exist. People who are trying to make some insurance money or whatever. Exactly. Anyway, yeah. In the hospital, when uh, the Sylvia character now is ended up in the hospital, um, there was an interesting use of flashbacks to communicate some ideas. Um, so you know, like when Sylvia was in a, uh, in the hospital and then that um, that lady uh, who was going to kind of um, sort of uh, help Sylvia out, you know, who ran her over. Well, she came over and there wasn't intertitles, but there were flashbacks to the school and what their needs were. Hmm. And I feel like Oscar's use of that was pretty interesting. Like right. it was using flashbacks to communicate the fact that Sylvia was here for getting money for the school rather right. than using intertitle saying, you know, Sylvia was telling this woman that she needs money for the school. She sh- he showed it using flashbacks. I thought right. that was pretty sophisticated for that time. It know? was. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought the same thing. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's really all the big notes I have on this. I mean, other than the things we talked about. <laughs> All right, folks. I think that's pretty much it. Um, and uh, we'll uh, be back next week for more. And uh, thank you again, listeners, for uh, tuning in. And uh, if you have any uh, uh, feedback, please uh, put a star rating or write the feedback into our Apple Podcast platform so we can stand out amongst other podcasts as well. And uh, if you need to uh, find us, you can find more of our stuff at uh, watchingsilentfilms.wordpress.com. Again, that's watchingsilentfilmsplural.wordpress.com. And you, or you can uh, send us an email with uh, watchingsilentfilmsplural at gmail.com. And uh, thank you, Bob, and thank you, Lily. And uh, that's all we have for this week. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Yeah.